This is Bishop Gregory Brewer's sermon at St. Patrick's Episcopal Church, Ocala, Florida, December 15, 2013, the third Sunday in Advent. I would like us to agree in prayer together about something. I pray this prayer just about, well, pretty much, yeah, everywhere I go. And the prayer is this. Yeah, I've done my preparation about the things that I feel like I'm supposed to say into the sermon. But I want us to pray together that God would say the things that he wants to say. Can we do that? Um, So let's be open together and see what the Lord might do. Let's pray together. Gracious Lord, you are the one who knows people's hearts. Where they've been, what they've done, what's on their minds the guilt, the fear, the joy, the thanksgiving, the sadness. And I thank you that we can bring all of who we are into your presence because you know our hearts and you love us very, very deeply. And so we ask you, Lord, speak to us, Lord. Your servants are listening. We yield to your authority here and ask that you would be the one to lead us and to reveal your word. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Advent, the season that we're in, is about waiting. It's about longings that haven't been satisfied yet. Asking God to break through in ways that we have yet to see but long to happen in our hearts, in our churches, in our community, in our country, in the world. It acknowledges the fact that there is a gap, and that this is normal, that there's a gap between the promises that we see in Scripture and the things that God says He's going to do and what our experience is of those promises. Because there are things that have yet to be fulfilled. It shows up in the very opening lines in Isaiah where it talks about a world that you and I have actually never seen. Where there's no fighting, where there's no war, where creation itself gets along with each other. There's no fighting, even between animals and different species. Where the kinds of terrible things that we see happening in terms of famines and earthquakes, hurricanes, all of that's gone. It's a part of the past where everything grows the way it ought to, and where all of the land knows nothing but peace and joy. I've never seen that, have you? See? It's something that God says He is, in fact, going to do, but we have yet to see it. It's still in the future. It's a part of what we anticipate when we talk about the coming of Jesus. A new heaven and a new earth. Everything changed. So... We know Him, but we have yet to experience all it is that He has promised that He will do because there are things that have yet to be unfolded. Are you with me? Does this make sense? Nod your head if it does. Okay. I I, want to say that because, you see, that's John's dilemma in the Gospel reading. He thought that Jesus would come, overthrow the Romans, and establish a brand new kingdom. But where is John? He's in jail. He's been arrested by Herod Antipas. And he knows that to be in that jail is a death sentence. He'll never get out. He knows that. And so, I thought you were going to come and set everything right. And I'm going to die in this jail. No wonder, you see, he sends some of his followers... To go to Jesus and say, are you really the Messiah? This this isn't what I expected. And isn't that like us? When there's this gap between what we expect God to do and what we actually experience in our lives, our temptation is the same as John's. Oh, maybe this doesn't work after all. Maybe the promises about who Jesus really is. I'm glad you like that, but maybe this isn't true for me, okay? 
I mean, no judgment on you, but it's not working for me. That's what we will say, you see, right? Mm -hmm. And a part of, that's where John is. Are, are you really the one who is to come? Meaning, are you the Messiah? Are you really the Son of God? This isn't what I expected at all. And what is Jesus' response? He said, okay, you go tell John. And what he's actually doing in his response is paraphrasing the very lesson that we read in Isaiah. Go tell John. The blind see. The deaf hear. The lame walk. The mute speak. And the poor have good news preached to them. That meaning, you see, because in the old Jewish system, if you were poor, it meant God was not pleased with you. That you were operating under a curse, you see. And that meant you were under God's judgment. And so when Jesus says that last line, what he's trying to say is, no, in this era, salvation, God's good news is, is open to everybody. Doesn't matter where you've been, doesn't matter what you've done, your education, your family, rich, poor, no matter what your police record is, no matter where you've been in the past, you also can come and receive all that this Messiah has for you. You can come. Jesus is quoting to John, hold steady, you don't see it all yet, in other words, but it's really happening. Yes, in fact, I am the one. We're in the same position, are we not? Because there are times where we may not actually land in jail, although some might. And something terrible can happen to us. And we say, is this for real? God, are you who you say you are? And what does Jesus do? He do, does two things. First of all, he quotes the scriptures. Because, you see, in the midst of my circumstances, when sometimes I feel close to God and other times, I don't feel like I'm close to God at all. Right? Is that true for you too? Nod your head. Of course it is. We're, we're, we're being real here, you see. Does that mean that somehow God has changed if my feelings change? No, not at all. But you see, that's not what my feelings tell me. What my feelings tell me is that if I'm not feeling close to God, then something must be wrong. Either I've done something wrong, or God is not pleased with me, or, and particularly if it gets into this long stretch, what some people call a dry season, then I actually can get to the place to where I actually wonder whether God's around or whether he even cares for me. I went through a time, I still remember this so clearly, when I'd been reading my Bible every day and doing the things that I felt like I was supposed to do, and one day all of my personal sense of God's presence was gone. I felt absolutely nothing. And it went on for a long time. The only thing I had to hold on to in the midst of that, I thought, God, have, have you abandoned me? I mean, that's, that, that's what I had in the midst of just feeling like nothing was out there. You know those times, tell me this is true for you too, where you pray and you feel like your prayers just sort of hit the ceiling and come back on the floor again. There's nobody listening. The only thing I had was that when I'd been reading the Bible, I would underline and I would make little marks in the margins about what that meant to me. And I would read those marks in the margins, and I would read the scripture, and I would say, there's no way I could have made that up. God really did speak to me. And that's what I held on to in the midst of, in the midst of that incredibly dry season when I felt like God was absent. And then one day, out of the blue, for seemingly no apparent reason, all of the sense of God's presence and his companionship came back. And then what I began to figure out was, even though nobody had ever told me, that's not abnormal. Doesn't mean I'd sinned or anything like that had happened at all. Well, of course we sin. We sin all the time. But it wasn't as if in that moment that God had chosen to withhold his forgiveness. And in fact, 
ages ago, if you read the Psalms, you know, here's David crying out, why are you so far from me? I mean, that's in the Bible so that we would know that that's normal life. There are times when we feel God's companionship, and there are other times when we don't feel anything. Because that's just a part of what it means to be human. And we haven't escaped this body, so we're still human. Right? Nod your head. <laughs> and so there are times when we feel a lot of God's emotion and His joy. There are other times when we don't feel anything, and that's, that's normal. In fact, one of the most famous pieces of Christian literature is by St. John of the Cross called, what, the dark night of the soul, where he describes in profound detail what it means like after having known and felt God's presence to feel nothing but God's absence. That's John in jail. Jesus quotes the scripture because especially in those times of dryness, even when you feel like you're reading the scripture and it just makes no cognitive sense whatsoever, it's like, I don't even, you still make the decision to keep at it. Because that's what feeds your soul, even if you have no experience of being fed. There are some times when you're fed and you know it. It just feels great. There are other times when you read the Bible and it's like, what? But you still read it. <clears throat> because God, it, it's like seeds being planted in the ground. You can't see the shoots yet, but the seeds are certainly being put in there. You stay faithful. You read the scriptures even when you don't feel anything. The second thing you do, and, th and this is where John was so right by sending his friend, you stay connected with other people. I mean, John could have gotten to the point, but thank God he didn't, where he said, disciples, you go do something else. I'm dead, I'm gone, I'm not going to have anything more to do with this. I guess it didn't work out after it was all, have a nice life. He didn't do that. He sent his messengers to Jesus. And in the James lesson this morning, there's a call in that passage for us to stay connected to each other, to strengthen one another, it says. Because at any moment, in the midst of a group this size, there are at least four or five people in the room right now, if it's statistically accurate, that are exactly in this dark night place. They're not feeling much of anything. And they're only showing up out of sheer loyalty. This is my church, so this is where I'm here. Am I rejoicing in Jesus this morning? Absolutely not. But I need you, my brothers and sisters, to stand with me in this dark time. Because you see, there are times when I don't feel anything. And that's when actually I need prayer the most. I need support the most. The very times when I want to withdraw are actually the very times I need to be the closest with the people who love me and who love Jesus and who can pray for me on my behalf. It's that mutual strengthening. That's why nobody, and I mean nobody, can really make it alone out there as a Lone Ranger Christian, not connected into a fellowship of people. I mean, can I be frank? That's just really stupid. It's stupid. Because you see, when God put His Spirit within us and made us His child, He automatically, in the spiritual realm, connected us with other Christians. And there is a longing that God places within us to be a part of a fellowship of people that love each other, that, where we can speak honestly about what really what's going on in our lives, and where we can serve together. And there's something inside of us that is never really satisfied until we're part of that kind of Christian fellowship. So that when I'm in, and when I'm that, I believe me, I know who to call. Please pray for me. Life's not easy right now. That's what the call is in James, to strengthen one another. So that when you feel like John the Baptist in jail, which all of us have happened to us from time to time, what John of the Cross calls the dark night of the soul, what do we do? We stay faithful to the scriptures, number one. And two, we bring other people into the circle of our own place of darkness. Pray for me. Please, 
I need to know that I'm not alone in this one. And we have people stand with us. You're going to ha see this liturgically acted out when these people are presented for confirmation and one is presented for baptism. And I'm going to ask you a question. Will you do all in your power to support these persons in their life in Christ? And you'll say, we will. This is what I'm talking about. To be with them, whether times are good or whether times are awful. Because it is normal life for there to be a gap between what we see in the promises of God and what we're experiencing in our lives. Sometimes it's pretty good. Sometimes it's really bad. Doesn't mean that this isn't true. It just isn't fully manifested yet. And we're waiting for God to do something that he has yet to accomplish in us and in our midst. We are waiting that is Advent. And in fact, Advent is a liturgical season. It's meant to remind us that this kind of waiting is a normal part of the Christian life. And sometimes it's seasonal. We go through times when we wait more than others. But there's always that sense of God's doing something. It's out here. God's doing something in here. But there's a gap. And so, look, God, I am longing for you to bridge that gap and draw closer to me than what I've known in the past. To do some new work in me. To bring a new level of your intimacy, of, the intimacy of your presence. The sense of who you are as the one who loves me and claims me as his own. That I belong to you. That you'll never let me go. The wonderful promise where Jesus says, I will never leave you or forsake you. Nothing can take you out of my hand. That's what this season is about. That's what the lessons are about. So when you get into those places where you feel like you're in that dark night, please do not say, oh, what have I done? That's the natural inclination. That somehow, you know, I, I've blown it in a way that is, that's caused God to depart from me. That is a lie. When Jesus says, I will never leave you or forsake you, and nothing can take you out of my hand, that means in the worst things that you're enduring, whether you feel it or not, Jesus' presence is right here. In you. And we wait for the time when all of that is manifested. In us, in the fruit of how he uses us in the lives of other people. But eventually in his return, when a new heaven and a new earth happen, and where God wipes away every tear <coughs> from every eye. So, P.S. Don't let anybody say to you, well, if you had more faith, you wouldn't be in this mess. Not true. Don't let anyone say to you, well, if you just repented, no, I'm forgiven, but I still sin. And that's what it means to be a Christian. <laughs> it says in 1 John, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So don't get into that one. Instead, continue to be real in the presence of God. Express all that is in your heart. No matter what's there, believe me, he can take it. Stay close to the scriptures and let it speak its truth into your life. Have those relationships with others with whom you can speak your heart, who can hear you and who can pray for you so that you are strengthened by them as you walk through those times. And believe me, you'll get through them. God will provide even though sometimes it feels like we're walking in the dark. And he will take you every single step of the way. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you that when we come into your presence, we don't have to be a cheerleader forcing ourselves to feel a certain way. I thank you that when we come into your presence, we can just be us. And you know us. And you receive us just as we are. That we can be real with you. 
And you, in turn, are very real to us and with us. Continue to draw us closer. Help us, O oh God, when we don't feel like doing anything. <clears throat> Remove the burdens of condemnation and fear that we sometimes feel, that cause us to feel alienated from you. Help us, O oh Lord, to be patient in our waiting, knowing that only you can work in us that which you desire. And so we yield to you. And we thank you that we are yours and that you will never let us go. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen.